Welcome to the first Presidential Dialogue Series of 2023. This year's focus is on reimagining communities of change. Thought leaders in business, politics, and journalism are exploring the tools and values we need to transform our communities and advance a shared sense of the public good. Throughout the series, we will examine how some of the instability created by crisis can also create space for productive, progressive transformation. In such spaces, we will have to position ourselves as agents of such change. I'm thrilled to have Seth Goldman here as our guest. He is a leader in both business and sustainable food production and has drawn many business students to his career path. I'm going to ask actually a, a current MC student, Madeline Hishme, to introduce him. Ms. Hishme is a Macklin Business Institute student who is graduating in May with her associate's degree in business. Madeline is the marketing lead for our student-run business on campus, a presentation team member for our Enactus, and a grant advisor for the Carl M. Freeman Foundation. She hopes to transfer to the University of Maryland in the Smith School of Business next fall, but has also been accepted to Pepperdine University in California. So, sounds like she has a few options. So, I will invite now Madeline, Madeline up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Williams. As you may know, Seth Goldman is a local entrepreneur who is first known for his creation of Honest Tea, a highly successful brand of tea which was sold to Coca-Cola. Mr. Goldman is now the co-founder and chief change agent of Eat the Change, which produces organic plant-based snacks, which you may have tasted this morning. He is also the co-founder of Plant Burger and chair of the board of Beyond Meat. Mr. Goldman recently launched his latest tea line by combining justice with tea to create just iced tea, which you may have just sampled. Mr. Goldman has been a leader in democratizing organic food and building businesses based on fair trade practices. He has merged his passion for social justice with healthy, profitable products. Mr. Goldman and his wife, Julie Farkas, who is here today, have also launched ETC Impact, which is donating $1.25 million over the next three years to nonprofit organizations that educate and inspire consumers to make climate conscious choices with their diets. Mr. Goldman is a graduate of Harvard College, the Yale School of Management, and is Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute. He has been widely recognized for his entrepreneurial impact, named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in Greater Washington, the Beverage Industry Magazine Executive of the Year, and the Partnership for Healthy America's CEO of the Year. We are thrilled to welcome Seth Goldman to Dr. Williams' Presidential Dialogue Series. Thank you again so very much for, for being with us here today. Thanks it's an, for having it's me. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I think take an opportunity right now to kind of to, to level set because you know the unique perspective that you bring. We'd like to just start off with a, would just please talk a little bit about what certified organic and certified sure. fair trade mean and so that we're all on the same page and, and why are these why are these concepts, why are these so important to you? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's very appropriate we chose the word just ice or justice as the uh, foundation of our name because to me, this is about having a, a just and fair relationship with the earth. We should not be taking more or extracting more from the earth than we're giving back to it. Mm -hmm. And so organic is a system that uses no chemical, synthetic chemical pesticides or fertilizers. Um, and so it regenerates as we, as we you know, harvest, we're regenerating um, and, and uh, uh, renutrifying the earth, the planet. Um, so that's the environmental part of it. And then fair trade is a, um, a certified way to work, treat with treat workers. So uh, what it means is that, that first of all, there's no child labor, no prison labor. All of the wages are um, reviewed and you know made deemed uh, fair in the by the International Labor Organization. And then a portion of the the sales every time we buy a pound of tea leaves or or a gallon of agave or even honey, a portion of the sales goes back to the workers uh, for them to invest in the way that they think is appropriate. So for us, that also 
is a just way to treat people involved in the supply chain. And so um, one of the magical things about tea in particular is that we can sell you know, what really is some of the world's best quality tea and it's still only, even with all the things we invest in, in the planet and in the community, it's still pennies a bottle for the tea. So our point of view is we should be in, uh, making sure we are treating every stakeholder along the way as, as ethically as we can. Wow, that is fantastic. There's so much there. I like <laughs> just keep asking questions about yeah. that as an initial question. Um, I mean, you talk about you know, certification like international organizations. Yeah. And you know, as you know, we have a lot of international students here at Montgomery College. So right. could you share, just, uh, probe that a little bit more, um, which, which countries yeah. do you source from and what really provoked your interest in, in labor conditions and you know, profit and interconnectivity around the world? Sure. Uh, well, it really starts with the fact that tea is the world's second most popular beverage, second only to water. Really? So tea is, uh, every culture around the country has some kind of a tea. They use. Now, it may not always be the same plant, but whether it's a, some kind of a brewed botanical huh. is, is connected to every culture. Uh, and it turns out that tea leaves, the kind we use, are grown in India, China, um, and then we just brought on a new source in Mozambique, um, which, which I'm ex extremely excited about. We'll talk more about that. Um, because all, all tea leaf really needs is um, good, rich soil, uh, a lot of moisture, you know, and, and then often you know, um, high altitude. But it can be grown any place like that. It can't really be grown in the United States, by the way. So by definition, we're sourcing from around the world. Uh, and then our sweetener, um, we use uh, agave, which is grown in Mexico. We use uh, organic honey, which is grown in Brazil. Uh, and so each of those, with organic, there's a lot of um, rules about how it has to be grown. And so, for example, organic honey can't have a pollution source within three miles of where the bees are. And so in the United States, it's actually, I think it's almost impossible to grow organic honey in the United States because there's pollution. Even a golf course counts as a, if they're using, you know, pesticides oh. on the ninth green, then that, that's not a source. So. For us, um, we actually go to the rainforest in Brazil and other parts where um, there's enough forest. So this is actually a way to also protect these natural ecosystems, right? The, the, there's commerce there, but it's un, you know, it's not, it doesn't rely on development to protect these ecosystems. Um, and so it's, it's really if, um, given, given us and my whole family an amazing opportunity to connect to cultures around the world. And we always think about when we bring these tea, that we're, we're, yes, we're bringing a drink and it has to quench someone's thirst, but we also think about it's, it's sharing, um, sharing a part of the world with people. And so the green teas from China or Mozambique you know, connect people to that source. And sometimes they don't know it, and, and that's okay, but we love it when we can connect them to the source too. That is just so many different, you know, kind of, pieces of connectivity, right? right? So many different kind of uh, parameters and, 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 and guidelines yeah. and just, just so much to know what... Well, so, and that's what yeah. food is, right? I mean, you know, what's so interesting about food is it is what we become, right? right. What we take in is what becomes... And, and it's the same in the, in the way we impact the planet because everything we eat comes from the planet. And so every time we eat, we have this opportunity to have an impact on what happens to the planet. And so this phrase we've chosen, eat the change, is our, it's our mindset, it is, but we also want the mindset that we want our consumers to embrace as well, that when you eat, it, it is how you're changing yourself, but it's also how you're changing the planet. And if we continue to, to consume without giving back, yeah. then you know, what, what happens, right? We can all do, we yeah. can all do the math. So kind of speaking of, of, of that, would you please share a bit about the, the challenges that you've encountered in, in maintaining some of the practices, you yeah. mentioned fair trade and sustainability, throughout your career, and, and then I'll ask you a follow-up. that just sure. start with those? Well, so certainly the, the approach we take, it more, uh, there's more cost to it, right? When you, right. Um, when you in, are in fair trade, you're, you are giving money back to this community, and so it's cheaper to not do that. Yeah. Um, hmm. When you invest in organic, we believe over the long term organic makes sense, but in the short term, uh, it's harder for farmers to go organic because they're used to a system that relies on these chemical pesticides. And, and so rather than having to worry about how to control uh, or interact with, with whether it's pests or, or bugs or even fungus, just to throw chemicals at it is a, is a short, cheaper solution. And so there's naturally in a marketplace, lower price is one aspect mm. of what makes something appealing. And so uh, our job is to help consumers understand why it may make sense to spend a little more. Of course, we work hard to keep our prices low because Maddie talked about democratizing. That's important for us. We want to make sure we can 
make our products accessible. And part of that means not being too high priced, but when it is a little higher price, we want people to understand what is the value they're getting in exchange for that. That's, and how has, how, how has, how did the pandemic change any of, yeah. or, or all of that? <laughs> um, well, so with, with Honest Tea, in a sense, Honest Tea was a victim of the pandemic. Um, so what happened is, you know, we sold Honest Tea to Coca-Cola in 2011. I stayed on through 2019, just um, sort of, I left at the end of 2019 to pursue other things. And uh, then what happened was, then the pandemic started shortly after that, Coca-Cola ran into a lot of supply chain issues. Um, so I would go to the store and I only see a few varieties of Honest Tea when there used to be eight or 10. Uh, and then um, they also ran into other supply chain challenges. So I think Honest Tea got neglected. Coming out of the pandemic, they realized that um, they needed to shore up the existing business, which in most cases meant you know uh, fizzy things in cans. Yeah. And so when they decided we have to cut some things, they decided they were gonna cut Honest Tea. Um, and so, you know, obviously, I, we were heartbroken when we got this news. This was in May, I remember the date, uh, May 23rd of last year, oh, wow. I had a call with Coca-Cola senior management. They said, we're going to be cutting on this tea. It was, you know, they gave me the courtesy of telling me. <laughs> um, but it was, I, I've described it as a gut punch. I mean, that, that all, not just, not just me, but my wife and our sons and, and all the employees. I mean, literally by that point, thousands of people had built on this tea. It was something we really cared about. And when we heard it was being discontinued, it was, there was this just shock and really sadness. Uh, and then 10 days later, we decided to take action. <laughs> but, but it was, it was, a, um, it was, it was you know, um, it was a sad development for sure. That's, um, let's look at the, the flip side of, that we talked about, some of the challenges that came from the pandemic. Yeah. Did, has it made anything easier? Has it made a kind of a smoother glide path for anything? that you're doing in terms of your philosophical and practical approach to? You know, I think for me it sharpened my, my sense of what matters and what I'm going to be doing, what I choose to do. Um, I had gotten, after I left Honesty, there was this moment where I was trying to think about, well, should I go into politics or do something else? And um, especially after, you know, Coca-Cola discontinued Honesty, I just said, this, this cause, uh, this idea of trying to connect values and ethics to business is, is my cause. This is, uh, and, and it's not, it's not going to succeed on its own. Like, you know, losing honesty was a setback for this kind of movement because it helped, it, it, we, you know, in one sense, when we sold to Coca-Cola, we thought, here's a big company adopting, you know, that we were the first organic and first fair trade brand inside of the world's largest beverage company. So that was a huge milestone. But then having it discontinued could be a big setback. And, and in fact, one of, my, one of our tea suppliers said, we'd hate to think this was a failed experiment. And I said, as long as I'm still breathing, this will not be a failed experiment. We're, we're determined to prove this can work, this right. must work. Um, really, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm certainly not the only person doing it, but if we want to make capitalism viable, if we want to make society viable, we have to find a way for business to operate with a mindset that takes into account other stakeholders besides just shareholders. Wow. And so, um, so for me, this is the work that I'm, I'm dedicated to. And, and I will say, um, as while we were so upset with Honesty be discontinued at first, we now realize this is a gift. To be able to go back and um, reignite this, this category, to, to go back into business, and, and even just as a business itself, um, it's a gift. Because we, we have a snack business, and we're very proud of it, but uh, we're already, you know, 95% of our sales now are tea. <laughs> And we are now, um, so we've been in the tea business for six months, but this month our sales will be where Honest, you know, on a monthly basis, where Honest Tea was in its eighth year. Mm -hmm. So that's an incredible, you know, turbo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, as an entrepreneur, that's just an amazing business opportunity. <laughs> I mean, we're so gratified because this, you know, our sourcing is, is even more sophisticated, the, the relationships we're developing with our suppliers. But... But as, just as a, as a straight business opportunity, that's um, just a gift to be able to have that in it. And of course, it, it shows that the consumers, it means something to the consumer. Right. It means something to the retailer. And it certainly means something to the supply chain. So uh, I'm sorry to keep no, going. No, the going other, the other moment thing that it's really um, sharpened for me is karma. That, you oh. know, um, when we got this news, uh, we were so upset about honesty being discontinued. And that week, I was just flooded with um, 
outreach from not just former employees, but suppliers. Mm -hmm. People who liked working with us before, who wanted to work with us again. And, and we're, they're all, we've kind of brought the band back together. And that's one reason we've been able to move so quickly. I mean, as I said, I got the news in May 23rd. We decided on June 6th that we were going to launch Just Ice Tea. And by September 6th, 90 days later, we were in the market, which is super fast. And the only reason that we were able to do that was because all of those partners came right back out. And so that's, to me, another you know, benefit of, of that whole approach. Um, it shows that the relationships matter and the values matter. And, and, and you know, all the people who came together you know, valued that. So thank you. I just hear so much of passion, speed, agility, connecting values and ethics to business. You know, fair trade, beyond stakeholder, uh, shareholder profits, yeah. so much, so much there. And we have, um, you know, students in, in the audience and people who are watching. So along those lines, what, what skills do you think young entrepreneurs can develop while, while in school? Mm. Um, you've mentioned that yeah. some of these, you know, what advice do you have? And, and along those lines, what advice do you have for, for balancing yeah. school, families, work, and, and, and passion? Yeah, well, it's a great, it's a great question, and it, it's something every student here has the chance to practice right now. And certainly, the one skill I think I have uh, developed more than any other is multitasking. And it's, it sounds funny. Well, is that a <laughs> skill? <laughs> but actually, um, you know, it really is, because that's what an entrepreneur has to do. Mm -hmm. And just as, you know, I know so many of the students here have responsibilities in their family. They have jobs they have to do. They have classes they have to do. They may have activities they have to do. All, being able to manage all that is what an entrepreneur does, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a meeting this morning on operations, and we are talking about production. But then I was meeting with marketing to talk about how we're going to handle this campaign. And, and then, you know, um, tomorrow I leave for New York for a whole week of sales activity. So wow. you have to be able to have mul handle multiple tasks at once. And you have to be able to um, compartmentalize. You have to be able to say, okay, mm -hmm. now if I'm, thinking, if I'm thinking about marketing, I've got to put all of my focus on that. Mm -hmm. And then I've got to be able to put that down and have to go talk about, well, what's going to happen with our bottle caps and think about production and operations. And just as you have a, a job to do, if you have a job, you've got to do your job. You, you, you really can't study while you're, you can't study well if you're supposed to be doing work and another thing. And so um, that, ability, especially in today, you know, it, what I've often said with social media is now you're like multi, you multi thinking segments all the time, but you have to be able to focus and, and address a task and then be able to switch gears and, and address another task as well. So multitasking, being able to focus, also switch quickly. Yes. Um, so what would you say in terms of which of those skills or a specific skill do you reflect back and like, I really learned this from kind of mm. formal education <laughs> and or yeah. I learned this from kind of being yeah. out there or it's kind of amalgamation, like what? Yeah, it's what? very funny because as, as you, you, know, you heard, I, I went to some very good colleges you know, in my education, but so much of what I've learned and been able to apply is from life experience. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I always say that I learned so much coaching my my son, my youngest son's eight-year-old baseball team. Uh, <laughs> now, I didn't play baseball at all growing up, but he, had, he made the travel team. Uh, and because I'd been around the baseball fields, I was asked to be the head coach of his eight, eight and under travel team. And I thought, boy, that's an unusual assignment. Like, I, I know how baseball is played, but I literally, you know. And, um, mm -hmm. But what happened was that summer, we had, we had a great little group of um, kids, and they went undefeated. And, and I, yes, they were, good, they were good players, but a lot of what it was was giving these eight-year-olds, you know, who's, that's, a, that's a challenging, can be a challenging group of kids, just able to think and support each other, to understand the, the roles they had and how to interact with each other and how to come back from disappointment uh, and, and sort of uh, be able to, to, you know, sort of get settled and, and act. So, so a lot of the... Um, things I've learned are from life experience and been able to apply them yeah. to work as that's, well. That's great. And I will share just as a personal note, Seth, I think I'm going to be an assistant coach for a five-year-old. There you go. <laughs> that's uh, it. Yeah. It, so, so thank you for giving me hope that I didn't you think I would it. receive during this conversation. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm inspired. Um, <laughs> so when we think, I hear, I do hear a, kind of a, a mix of you going to very good schools and obviously learning there and then combining mm -hmm. that with what you're, you know, learning experientially yeah. and kind of the the field in business and industry. Um, 
there's a, you know, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. So yeah. school, you get a lot of knowledge. Yes. And then when it's really impactful is when you can connect it to wisdom. And yeah. so you can think about how to apply it in a way mm. that is relevant, makes sense, and also that, uh, that you can share it with people right. in a way that's digestible for them too. Right. So that critical foundation and then leading to the very important. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, along those lines and just the kind of comprehensive nature, could you just touch, would you please touch on the uh, um, importance for a few moments of, of, a, of a strong partner and a work-life oh, balance. You just yeah. mentioned <laughs> being a baseball coach. You mentioned just multitasking, yeah. but getting compartmentalizing, but needing to stay specific, right? Yeah. Going from production to something else. But you know, I know, and I've, I've, I've met you and had a wonderful time getting to know you over the past few years. I've also met Julie and had a wonderful time getting to know her. Um, you know, I, I know your wife has been a huge yeah. partner in, in several ways in this work. So what, what would you share about just the necessity of, yeah. of having a strong partner. Yeah, it's critical. I, I um, uh, every part of everything I've done, really, Julie has been a part of, not just as a, as a thought partner, but as a um, sort of, uh, more, you know, spiritual, moral partner, um, helped. Yeah, we've had, a, you know, it's, 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 it's nice to be up here to talk about the success. There's been a lot of disappointments, right? A lot of setbacks and a lot of challenging times. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's great when you can feel success and feel to share that <laughs> But it's even more important when you feel like you're, you know, how are we going to meet payroll, or are we going to go out of business? And someone who believes in you, somebody who who shares your values and knows that whether this succeeds or not, um, they're going to be with you. And and so, um, I think that is of all the, um, you know, I'd say, fortune or places places I've been fortunate, having a partner um, who who believes in me as much as I believe in her. Has just been invaluable, and so you know, um, yes, honesty. When I, when I, sort of came home and said, I think I'm going to do this. She was like the first one. Let's you know, you're, let's do it. We're in, and she was the one who found out about Beyond Meat. Uh, you know, we'd been vegetarian for um, several years at the time, and this was in 2012. And she read this article and said, you know, you, you need to help these people find a way to scale that business. And so I sent an email out there, uh, and so it's just been a. Um, it's really been the, 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 the joy of my life to have somebody who's, who's such a, 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 a key partner. That's great. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so talk, um, I've heard you talk about this being a mission-driven entrepreneur. Yeah. Right, and you've talked uh, several times uh, responses to questions about about your values and I kind of see them and the answers and mm -hmm. so how um, just a little bit more about how your values influence decisions you've made specifically in a, a business or, or your, your your product choices right oh but yeah at the end of the day uh, I mean like you said you mentioned you know there are people who are concerned about profits right yeah. you know the impact on uh, the community both locally and, mm -hmm. and globally mm -hmm. so how did you come to the point of these are the values that you're going to hold true to and yeah. kind of do you have lines that you just you just don't cross? Sure. Well, so first of all, I want to make sure I don't want to make it sound like I don't pay attention to shareholders because no, I no, 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 you didn't, no, no, you didn't imply that. But I, I, okay. I mean, you know, so what I, when I mentioned all the folks who came back to um, help build Just Ice Tea, yes. there were also tons of honest tea uh, investors who said, hey, we'd love to go around again with it nice. with you so that was a, I think a showing we you know we do pay attention to them and they they had a great experience both financially and sort of um, ethically <laughs> with honesty um, and so for 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 me it's really pretty simple um, it's what I believe in and I'm not going to do something I don't believe in mm -hmm. I just don't uh, and uh, and even what I uh, going back to my talk about a partner uh, it's, if, it's, if one thing if I sort of see well maybe this makes sense if Julie says that doesn't make sense I'm not I got to like, it, it, there's been multiple times, especially in our conversations with Coca-Cola, where there were some questionable decisions, and, and I'd talk to Julie, and then I'd come back and say, there's no question about what we need to do here. So it really is just a, um, it's a belief system. Obviously, I, I believe that it's important, not just for my own health, that I, I don't want to sell anything that's not healthy for anybody else. You know, and that's a big gap, because um, you think about some of these other big food companies, it's their core product, if it's not healthy, um, it's like, how do you sell that? Uh, and so that, for me, is, is a core one. But also environmentally. It's got to be something I can believe makes sense environmentally. And, you know, there's an interesting 
question we come up across with packaging, right? Because even though the, C, the tea is sourced organically and it's fair trade, it isn't a package that's a single-use package. It's recyclable, okay. but there is a, there's an environmental concern. So I want to do as best I can with the package, but you know, to me the answer isn't, well, if, I, if I'm worried about the environmental impact, then I shouldn't be selling anything in a package because then, then I'm not making any kind of impact. So th that's, I'd say, where there's some accommodation, but it really is. I have to be able to not just look myself and my wife in the eye, I have to look my employees in the eye um, and our customers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think oftentimes, you know, we look at our, our personal values and ethics and, yeah. and you know, what we're doing professionally and sometimes there's, you know, we, we yeah. want there to be an alignment. I think we feel better, um, you know, kind of in our soul when there's that set of a so alignment. I feel better. like that's what I'm hearing yeah. from you. It's, yeah. it's that alignment just... You know, and I would say on the one hand, maybe I'm spoiled. I, I can feel like every job I've ever had, I've had that belief system. But, but you know, it's not necessarily spoiled. It is sometimes you have to make choices about what you do. And, 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 and um, there have been times where, you know, it's harder because often these jobs don't pay as much or they're certainly not as available. It's not like recruiters, right. as many recruiters come for these kind of jobs. But um, the, the rewards are, e even financial rewards aside, the, the the ability to act on something you believe in is, is, is such a gift. Yeah. As someone who is very mission-driven and passion-oriented, right. what you're saying very right. much very much resonates with me. Um, you do share a little bit about or uh, talk about democratizing organic. Um, you just say, what, what does that mean? Many of our students, and according to a recent survey, actually 36% of our students experience food insecurity yeah. um, within a short period of time and you know may live in areas where there are you know food food deserts sure um, and other types of other other terms that we know encompass kind of the not only the access but the quality of food yep. that you're able to in, consider consuming yeah. Yeah. so what what does that term mean sure. Can you share a little bit more so um, the way most of our food system works in the United States is that people who are uh, wealthy and healthy have lots of access to healthy food mm -hmm. Um, and that's, I don't want those people not to have access, but I, I certainly don't want them to be the only people to have access to healthy food. Sure. And so um, one of the things that we really challenge ourselves is how do we make sure we can make our products available to everybody, not just uh, by lower prices, but by distribution, uh, making sure it's distributed more widely, uh, and, and that there's information to both make them aware of what makes food healthier, um, but also they understand how to use it. And so. You know, there's a lot of different ways that's happened. So um, Honest Tea, I mentioned, was discontinued, but Honest Kids is still part of Coca-Cola. That was our, our juice drink. And what's really exciting about Honest Kids is it is now democratized as a, as a drink, and it is carried in McDonald's and Wendy's and Subway and Chick-fil-A, and it's at a price point that is line priced. That, you know, it's not more expensive because it's organic. And so what, that has, what it does is it means Honest Kids is often the first organic product millions of Americans get to taste. Wow. And then, because Honest Kids is much lower calorie, we, uh, Honest Kids is a 35-calorie juice box. It uh, went into McDonald's replacing an 80-calorie juice box, and we sold over 200 million units. So just getting Honest Kids into McDonald's helped remove over a billion calories from the American diet. And so wow. that's a positive step. Now, of course, it would be nicer if there were al healthier alternatives to McDonald's at scale, so we're not there yet, but it's a starting point. Absolutely. And so um, what we want to do with Eat the Change is, is um, get our products to market, get them to scale, and find ways to lower, uh, widen distribution and lower the prices. And it happens over time. It certainly doesn't happen in the first few years, but um, over time, we, and we already have some ideas about how to take our tea and make it in a more price accessible package uh, and to spread it. And then this, this grants program that Maddie mentioned that Julie and I have done is Eat the Change Impact. And what we do there is help communities around the country um, gain access to plant-based foods and understand how to incorporate them into their diet. Uh, because uh, if there's a myth out there that plant-based or food is, is more expensive. It doesn't have to be at all. But it's often the case that people don't know how to prepare these foods the same way. Uh, and so helping communities reconnect to a diet that's better for them, better for the planet. So and that, I think, segues into the, a question that I had, and I just want to kind of bring this so that I understand. Yeah. I feel like a lot of what you just said is, so is that what you mean by planet-friendly 
foods yeah. in terms of what kind of democratizing and yeah. other things. Or sure. Talk a little bit sure. more because it sounds, yeah. you also don't eat the chain. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. I want to be very specific about <laughs> okay. planet-friendly okay. foods and, you know, some of our, sure. we're testing some of those right now. Yes. Um, and then, you know, about eat the change. Right. So with Eat the Change, we have five planet-based commitments. Okay. And that's, and so I'll explain how they each sort of come to life. So the first one is everything is plant-based, meaning there's no animal products. Animal products consume much more water, much more energy, and mm -hmm. much more animals. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, so we stay away from uh, anything with animal uh, ingredients. Everything's organic, uh, going back to what I said about you know, avoiding chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers. We also look at food waste. We look for products where um, we can use all of the crop. And so uh, these carrots are a great example. These are um, carrot snacks, but they use every part of the carrot. Not the greens, but every, there's no, you know, the smallest part of the carrot or the largest part of the carrot is used. We also have a mushroom jerky that uses not just the, the mushrooms you might find in the store, but the stems or the bruised mushrooms or the oversized, the undersized. So many mushrooms don't make it to market. And we take all of them for our mushroom jerky. Okay. So that's around food waste. The other thing we look at is water waste. And it turns out that... Um, Carrots, where, whereas a pound of almonds require 1,900 gallons of water to make a pound of almonds, it only takes 20 gallons of water to make a pound of carrots and 40 gallons of water to make a pound of mushrooms. So we're looking for crops that are water and energy efficient. And then the last piece that we always look at is that uh, accessibility. How do we make sure these are available for all people over time? So five. That's that's the way we talk about planet-friendly food. That is amazing. That's um wow. That's. I want to transition to the audience in a, in a few minutes. But I have a, a couple more more questions. Um, when you look at the marketing campaign for Just Ice Tea, right? Different from the one you ran for for Honest Tea. Um, what you talked about this a little bit. What are what are some other differences? Yeah, the, a lot of the marketing is going to be very similar. So mm -hmm. so sampling, and you know, we're delighted that um, my uh, colleague Laura was able to be here and give out samples. We want people to taste it and understand what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, the thing about food is. I can describe it to you in a lot of words, or you can taste it in a sip, <laughs> and you get it right away. Very true. Uh, so <laughs> that's one thing. But uh, one thing we're doing at Eat the Change, and this we'll be announcing later this week, is we have a campaign called the Incredible Planet Challenge. It's an edible, focus on edible planet challenge. And for the first 21, because next month is Earth Month, and the first 21 days of the month, every day there'll be a challenge people can take on to move towards a more planet-friendly diet. So on the first day, I think it's April 1st, there's an, we're encouraging people to try plant-based dairy. So if you have coffee or if you have cereal, okay. try plant-based dairy. Then the next day, there's another suggestion, and we have a plant-based taco night, a plant-based pizza night. So all these, different, all these different ways to incorporate more planet-friendly foods into your diet. Uh, and this is, a, this is, of course, our name is on the campaign, but we really are partnering with lots of other brands because we want to encourage the behavior change for that. Okay. So, and behavior change, and I think, I, I heard um, you also the owner of thirteen restaurants. Yes, so that's yeah. shaking your head. And there's burgers on the menu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's plant. It's called plant, plant burger. Okay. Okay. It's P L N T burger, which could be plant or planet burger, uh, oh, uh, nice. or plenty burger. Okay. And everything is plant based. So it's burgers. They're delicious burgers. And I don't want to miss. I don't want to suggest that plant burger is a. It's not a health food chain. Mm. It's a, It's burgers and fries and shakes, oh. but they're delicious and they're all plant based and. Uh, there are uh, three in Maryland, three in D.C., uh, two in uh, Virginia, and then we have two in New York and two up in Boston, and wow. a few in Pennsylvania as well. So uh, up and down the East Coast, really fun. Uh, and the same, a lot of the same co-founders, Julie and, and my co-founder, Spike Mendelson, mm -hmm. as well. You mentioned something a little earlier in, in reference to a, a, a response. You said um, it was a great start. It might have been the, the billion calories were not... You know, we're not there yet. There was a yep. there, a place where you kind of, and others kind of want to want to see us, which I, I totally get. Yeah. Um, is it realistic, or how realistic is it to um, ask businesses to hold themselves accountable for workers, you know, fair pay and 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 weight well being? Is it, do we need to somehow change the system? Is it incentivizing? Is it what? It's all what's it's your, it's what, all what about, about what about consumers that? demand, right? So mm, you know, okay. um, consumers have the right to ask and expect. Uh, people to be treated better and they can express that. And what I've found is the stores and the restaurants do listen. Right. I mean, frankly, uh, you know, the reason McDonald's brought on Honest Kids was because they knew parents wanted some healthier option besides soda for their kids. And right. the organic was appealing and the lower calorie was appealing. 
Um, and so the more consumers demand it, the more these um, companies and, and restaurants and new grocery stores will respond. But consumers can't just demand it. They have to then buy it. They have to speak with their dollars okay. as well. Um, but those are absolutely reasonable expectations. And you know, it's, I, it was really interesting. I, I read an interview with one of the CEOs of one of the largest restaurant chains. I won't, I won't mention the, the name, but he talked about, he says, you know, our job isn't to shape what consumers want. It's just to give them what they want. And I disagree. I believe it is the responsibility of the company to try to direct. Now that you know, you um, you can't dictate everything because you'll you could lose all your customers. But the more you can encourage and, and nudge people towards healthier foods, the better you know for 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 them, and over the long term, the better for your business. Yeah. And the democratizing food component of that, I mean, yeah. In terms of if you don't, if you never have access, yeah. You know, having grown up in a certain kind of, you know, just atmosphere, you know, I didn't have access to healthy foods. Right, right. right. So individuals, groups, organizations who are helping to democratize that and help me, you know, have access to it, they are in a way shaping, right? Yeah. They're, they're informing me. I get to make an informed decision. But if I never had access to it, then I'm really just, you know, that's, yeah. you know. But it also mean you know, we also have to make it delicious because if you have, if you, you know, finally get access. I'll never have it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they said, they said, well, that wasn't any good. Um, so we have to really work on that. And, and that's something that, you know, has always been in development. But um, yeah. just the same with Plant Burger because I think a lot of people will have an a, existing bias against trying a plant-based burger mm -hmm. just because we have so much built in our culture around animal-based meat that um, we kind of have to make it extra delicious to, to make sure that the people come back. Very interesting. Very, well, I know I want to make sure that we get to audience members. I could ask you questions all day long. <laughs> we don't have all day. And I definitely want to engage our audience members. Who has the first question? Uh, early in your presentation, you had talked about in the supply chain returning money back to the workers. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, it's really Thank important you. because it's very easy to um, t uh, companies talk about when we give money back, it goes to the owner of the tea garden. And then the owner decides how they want to spend it. But that, of course, could be very much not what the community values. And I'll, I'll give you the example. So the way fair trade is structured, um, we pay money, but it doesn't go to the owner of the tea garden. It goes to a council that is monitored and enforced by the, the certifier, fair trade. And then the workers uh, vote on how the money is spent. And, and this is so important for so many reasons. So first of all, it gives not just the workers a say in their future, it especially gives women a say in their future because in, often in these communities, women don't have their own economic means. And so giving them a pool of money to invest in. But the other thing is really uh, often humbling is it's very easy for us in Maryland to say, oh, we'd love to, like for example, when I was at this, uh, in Mozambique, only half of this community had shoes, uh, children wow. and adults. And I thought, well, well, we should be getting shoes. Mm -hmm. But when we asked them what they wanted to spend money on, I, I was really, I kind of, I, I was just awestruck when they said they wanted to spend money on a hearse, on a, on a, a, a vehicle to, to take dead people out of the community. Wow. And I thought, wow. Well, what happens is there's, no one has cars here. And so if, when somebody dies, and let somebody die with dignity, it becomes very expensive to hire a car from outside of the village and, and uh, bring someone to a burial. So it was really striking that this is what they um, I'll give you another example. In India, we, uh, we worked with a community uh, in northern India, and we funded um, an eye care project. This community of 12,000 people, sorry, 6,000 people had never had access to eye care. Wow. We brought in adopters from outside that they, they were the ones who supported this. I mean, we spent, we, it was our money, but they were the ones organizing it. And 6,000 villagers got eye care that helped, uh, for some it meant literacy, for others it meant being able to do their job, and others it meant you know, treating cataracts that were undiagnosed. But if we had tried to bring eye care to Mozambique, where 47% of children never go to school, they would have said, that doesn't make sense for us right now. So you really have to, un the, our, our job, of course we try to understand the community, but the best understanding we can have is that we aren't the ones who should be making that decision. Consistently asking what the need is. Yeah. Really put, yeah. You know, so learning about the lived experience so we can best provide a, exactly. a pathway yeah. that's aligned with the values 
Um, mm -hmm. Other, I saw other hands. I know we're, we have, all right, we have a student, all right. Hello, how are you? Um, my name is Christopher. Um, I have a question about when Coca-Cola started to discontinue uh, honesty. Yes. Um, basically, I feel like most companies start to fail at that point. Um, but I f but how, why was honesty different in terms of how was it the relationship with the suppliers? Why were they so willing to come back and just help honesty come back up? Hmm. So for the suppliers, it was a huge setback when they heard that honesty was being discontinued, for sure. Um, but they had invested in the supply chain. And personally, I had lobbied. You know, I've been to, uh, um, especially India, uh, trying to convince them that organic was important and fair trade was important, and we wanted to set up that supply chain. So once, um, their, for many, it w the, the um, Coca-Cola was their largest customer. And so for them to lose their largest customer could have had devastating economic impact on them. I mean, loss of income, uh, and, and not just loss of income, loss of a, a value-added income. So tea is a commodity. It sells you know, at auctions at a certain price. But when you add organic and fair trade, you, you increase the price, and you give that community an economic, a cushion against being just a commodity. It's always hard to be a commodity because you don't have any ability to you know, assure your stability. And, and so uh, for these uh, communities, they, they were growing tea. They wanted to keep doing what they had been investing in. Uh, and fortunately, you know, now, now, even though I said on, we're already at where honesty was in year eight, we're not yet where honesty was in year 20. So we still have a lot of growth to make happen to, to be able to, you know, keep these folks um, earning the kind of money they, or at least from, you know, to grow the demand. That's, that's really our goal. What can we do? You talked about getting into different markets and being accessible. What can we do to get you into places like uh, Giant, Safeway, and Costco? Yes. Can we start letter writing campaigns, Absolutely. calling campaigns? <laughs> yeah. Thank Seriously. You. No, no, I, I greatly appreciate that. So, um, first of all, we are in Giant. Um, we are. We are in the natural aisle of Giant, but love to expand. Um, but the, you know, the stores really do pay attention to these requests. This, I'm, I, I'm not just saying that. It really is, it matters to them. They want to be relevant for their customers. And, and so um, when you can buy these products and, and, and express interest in it and share it with people, it helps spread it. It really does. I mean, you know, we don't have the kind of marketing budget that the big companies have. You see the Super Bowl ads and all the other things. That's not how we do it. I mean, <laughs> you just met our, you met our marketing <laughs> on the way in. Um, so, so we rely on people spreading. It's word of mouth that counts so much. And it's, it counts in, in, in spreading it to consumers, but it also counts in spreading it to stores. Um, and uh, we are, um, it sounds like we will be expanding to some of those chains you mentioned over the coming months. But um, we're working, we, we work on it every day. And, and it's always interesting, because I, I, we have just the most amazing team. Some of the folks on, on our team, I've been work, literally working with since, uh, for 25 years. So wow. they, the, uh, most of our team, in fact, more than half of our employees were former Honest Tea employees. So th they also came back. Um, but we all get so excited about the impact that we can have. And so you know, we celebrate the, 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 the revenue, the dollar growth, but we also you know, celebrate the expansion of, of the, the mission and the impact. That's great. So as the microphone gets to the next person, it just kind of segues into uh, really, um, so how important is it to have a well-informed consumer? Mm -hmm. And is that the responsibility of, of the business and or should it be? Um, we value the consumer so much. I mean, so the phrase, eat the change, really, it's a call to action, right? It is, it, this is not like, um, you know, we don't call our brand daisies. I mean, we were saying, eat the change. It's action we want. It's a, and it's, it's also about empowerment. We want to empower people with this knowledge and information. So we certainly take it, and as I said, this incredible planet challenge. We're doing what we can to educate the consumer, but of course it's not uh, only, we, we can't be the only ones doing that. Yeah. So it is great when, when schools and, and governments can, can raise awareness about healthy options. It's great when schools and governments and nonprofits can help make people aware of the, the externalities, the negative aspects of other um, things they're eating. Um, but it, ultimately, really, it's, it's all of our job to try to raise that awareness. Um, and 
you know, that said, we also, as a, we have to have fun. We can't just be a brand that is, you know, trying to say, you know, eat your broccoli and, <laughs> and, and, and be healthy. We've got to make sure people feel it's accessible. I mean, even the name Just Ice Tea, you can have fun. Oh, Justin, that's fun. You know, like, we've got to make sure this is a, a fun experience. We, um, one of the things people ask, so with Honest Tea, we, we had uh, cat messages underneath, and we've just uh, finished our first production run with uh, where we have our Eat the Change logo on the cap and, and fun quotes underneath too. And we've got to make it a whole uh, experience. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I know I saw other hands. and Yes. Hi. My name is Afi. I'm vegan. Oh, and nice. I thank you so much for all the effort. <laughs> thank you. My question is about uh, plain burger. I feel like it tastes like meat. Like, yeah. Like, uh, so I feel like I'm eating meat, even yeah. though I'm running away from meat. Yeah. So is there any way you can make it a little bit different? Because it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a vegan. That's a good question. And yeah. it, it's a, it's a fair, it's a fair attention. Yeah, yeah so, so on the one hand, like that's great praise because we're trying to get the meat eaters to come right. over. Right. On the other hand, I want to make sure there's something that you can enjoy <laughs> as well. We have, um, we, we're always working on the menu. We did recently add some products like a, it's called actual veggies. So it is, a, it is much it, more like a veggie burger that doesn't taste like meat. Okay. Um, but ultimately, um, we, to really get to scale, we've yeah. got to be able to market this product to more than the 3% of the population that's vegan or vegetarian. Yeah. Um, and so we want, uh, that's part of democratizing too, right? right? If we only are selling to vegans, yeah. then we're not really moving the needle. We yeah. want everybody to, to have access to this and to be able to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so there's a balance there. But, but um, I, take, I, t I take your challenge on, but I also take a little bit of a compliment from yeah. your question, too. I and I appreciate that. It also kind of goes back to uh, what you were saying earlier in terms of kind of animal-based products and how they've just been so infused yeah. and, and inculcated. I think I'll use an I statement into my life because I thought the goal, the goal is to have something that, that is plant-based that tastes like a burger. Like, that's the goal because <laughs> people are meat eaters, right? Yeah. Like, um, yeah. But that's a really interesting. Yeah. I really appreciate that, that question and it's interesting to see the, you know, the kind of positive yeah. friction with, with that. Other, other questions? Yeah. Okay. So my question is, if you, since, you're work, since you worked on Honest Tea, and you're expanding with other products you're developing. Do you like uh, develop it on the side as well, or probably after you're finished with Honest Tea, do you like work on that and then maybe another side project just so you can yeah. keep in business, something like that? Yeah, thank you. So I'll explain a little bit. So for when we were doing Honest Tea, it was, we were all in on tea. Yeah. And then what happened was we um, got asked by a chain of stores to make some lemonade for them. We're like, oh, we can make lemonade. That was kind of interesting. And then we, we have three sons, and our, our second son was um, taking the lemonade to school in his lunchbox. He was very proud to be able to show. You know. But then he would always come. He was a little guy, and he was only you know, drinking about a third of it. I thought, well, that's too much. We're wasting all this product. So <laughs> that actually led to the creation of Honest Kids. I said, well, what if we made a, a drink pouch that had so much less sugar? So that was kind of how that evolved. With Eat the Change, we weren't in the tea business at all. I had left tea. I was on to the next thing. And so we was thinking about how do we make a snack that is tasty and nutrient dense? And that led to the mushroom jerky. And then I thought about, well, how do we make a snack that could go in the lunchbox? Because Honest Kids was so successful. How do we make a snack for kids? And so the first thought we had was, could we take um, carrots and make them into carrot chips, just like potato chips, but carrot chips? And um, we couldn't get the, the right crispness. We also were wasting a lot of the carrot because you can't use the whole bottom third of the carrot. And then one of our suppliers sent us the wrong cut of carrots. They sent us those little coins. And, and my co-founder Spike said, I can't make any chips with this. But he tried something else. He soaked them in juice, and then he dried them out, and then they took on that chewy taste and we thought, well, wait a minute, this could be a really good replacement for fruit chews, which of course really aren't fruit at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we were doing those things and very happily focused on snacks when we got the news about uh, Coca-Cola and Honest Tea. And we had not at all you know, aspired to be back in the tea business. And I never would have wanted to compete against Honest Tea. One of my sort of principles is that when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, you've got to go uh, to spaces that are not occupied. You know, it can't go against all the big competitors. But with Honest Tea leaving, we said, well, that's a great business opportunity. Then we said, well, wait a minute, is it a planet-friendly food? 
And what we realized about tea is, and, and it's, it's an incredibly plant-friendly food. So um, tea bushes grow, uh, they're, per, they're, they're evergreen bushes. They grow, and for about nine months of the year in, in certain climates, they just grow new leaves. And so you pick the leaves, and then you come back in two weeks, you pick the leaves again. There's no um, harvest, there's no plowing, there's no irrigation. Right. It is just picking leaves off bushes and picking them again and again. So it's an incredibly uh, environmentally friendly plant. Uh, so for us, this fit in the, the charter 100%. Uh, and, and of course, the one thing is, oh, I didn't mention this. With, with, I talked about planet-based commitments. The one thing I left out is biodiversity. So we all know that a planet um, with more biodiversity is a healthier planet. It's more resilient. It'll respond better. It won't be. And so we looked at our food system and we realized there were six crops that are responsible for 57% of all agricultural production. And that's corn, soy, wheat, potatoes, rice, and sugar cane. And then we said, with the Change, we're not going to use any of those ingredients. And so when we looked at tea and we realized, well, honest tea used sugar cane. We said, well, are we going to uphold that commitment? We said, well, if we're serious about it, we well, have to. So we moved away from sugar cane and we uh, use only organic agave or organic honey as our sweeteners. Uh, yeah, another uh, alignment of values, yeah. ethics, and business. Yeah, and that, and that was a choice there because sugar cane's cheaper, yeah. um, and but we we felt like you know it's part of our principle and we're going to stick to it. Wow. wow. Yeah. Other oh up top, I know we have. Hi, my name is Caleb Salazar. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier um, when talking about how to get like really healthy foods into low income places or um, places that are kind of considered food deserts and. You were talking about your initiatives and like bringing um, the product to McDonald's. I was wondering if there are any other efforts that um, Eat the Change is doing to kind of help with that, or if there's anything you guys are doing forward to either change people's perception of healthy foods or just bringing healthier things to lower income places. Sure, sure. And I'll mention, by the way, because I, I am involved with Beyond Meat, that you know, Beyond Meat now is working with McDonald's in Europe, uh, and there we sell a. Um, it's called the McPlant Burger, okay. uh, which we sell in, in a lot of countries in Europe. We also have launched a, a, a line of chicken nuggets in uh, McDonald's in Germany, plant-based. Right. Uh, so, of course, no chicken, really. Um, so th those are ex efforts. Well, obviously, we hope that expands to more restaurants around the world. Um, with Eat the Change, it's still so early. So we have so much um, s open areas to go to. So yes, getting into a lot of the grocery chains that were mentioned is, is part of what we're doing. Um, we're also looking at how to bring um, a, a smaller package um, that can be priced less. Glass is a beautiful package, but it's also an expensive package. Especially, it's gone up. The price of glass now is twice as expensive as it was when I was launching on this tea. Wow. So just to give you a feeling for, um, so we're looking at other package, uh, uh, environmentally friendly package alternatives to, to make the price lower and to help expand distribution. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question, I think, before we, maybe two. Depends. I have, I have one uh, question. A lot of your work, uh, I, I'm going by the tagline of Eat the Change. Uh, my question is, in your efforts, uh, what are some of the top factors we have seen that open people up to accept the change? Like, is it more information or you know, just providing more information, probably going why plant-based products are good may not be enough. So I'm just curious, yep. in your effort, which factors you would list as top three or four that open people up to accept the change? Yeah. Well, one of the big barriers is cultural, right? People are just used to what they're used to. And, and thinking about, you know, animal products, we're all, we all grew up on, not all, I think almost all of us grew up on these, and this was part of whether it's a family tradition or a family ritual, it was what was most accessible and and today it's often what is very um, certainly what's marketed and what's affordable uh, and so the biggest and most effective way we have found to to change habits is information and of course uh, finding people that can that are open to it um, you know the information about the the impact is real and of course we know about what's going on with climate change yeah. what people often uh, make the mistake they understand that Climate change is going to impact what they eat. But they don't understand the, re the reverse. They don't understand that what they eat impacts climate change. Mm. You know, so when you look at greenhouse gases, um, animal products are a huge driver of that, you know, double digit. So we're 
rough, it depends on who you ask, it could be anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from our food system, and the primary driver are animal products. And so, um, you know, how is that framed? How is that presented to them? And then, how much are people willing to eat the change? How much are they willing to make a choice? And so, part of that comes back to taste. So, if it tastes great, it makes it easier. If they understand the context, it makes it easier. If it's priced excessively, it makes it easier. If the brand is fun and friendly, it makes it easier. So all of these things kind of have to combine. And, and we talk about this as a movement, and it's, it is a, it's a long journey. This is a mar I'm a marathoner, I'm not a sprinter, <laughs> so uh, that's a good thing. We have to think about this as a long-term journey. We want, all, and we want everyone, everyone ultimately to join us, but we'll take whoever we can get at this point. <laughs> Well, it's, it's great to hear your, your passion is absolutely palpable and your ener energy is just, you know, everywhere. Um, I do, we do have to wrap up this wonderful, wonderful conversation. I'm so very thankful that you were able to join us and just provide so much insight. Um, would love to provide you with a, a few moments to share final thoughts thank with you. us. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and thank you all for, for listening and everyone who's been tuning in. <laughs> um, just in closing, I'll say a few thoughts. So first of all, I mentioned our trip to Mozambique. We went just in January, and we've just put up on YouTube a video. So if you type in oh. Just Ice Tea Mozambique, you can see the most, uh, for me, uh, just beautiful video of, of our sourcing practices. And you get a sense of what it means in this community, which is, um, first of all, it's the most remote tea garden I've ever been to. It's the largest organic tea garden in the world. And um, it's unlike any, any place I've been to. It was magical. And so to be able to see that will, I think, give you a really uh, a deeper sense of, of uh, what it means to, to buy organic. Um, and I think the other thing I will just share is, is it really is this, is, uh, this is a brand, this is what I'm committed to doing, but each of us, each of you, has the ability every day to make a choice. And, 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 and while you know, it's wonderful if you want to join some of the folks in the room who are vegan, um, that's not the only way to do it. It can literally be uh, in a meal to say, okay, well, I am going to uh, try a plant-based dairy, uh, or I'm going to have one meal a day, or even one, one more meal a week that's plant-based. It, these are all, it all, it's a journey, all of us are on a journey, and it, 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 uh, it starts wherever you are. You know, you, you don't have to feel like, um, well, I, I, I'm no, I'll never be able to be vegan, so I can't, you know. You, you start wherever you are, and you start. You take a step, and, and from there, good things will happen. Well, I really appreciate that, the, the journey comment, considering we are at, you know, an institution of higher Absolutely. education, and we're all about continuous growth and development, researching, you know, looking at our journey, looking at the journey of others. Seth, thank you so much for sharing your insight, your inspiration. Um, just, I know that we've all learned so very much today. I know that our students, I know you've learned a, a lot about, I mean, socially responsible entrepreneurship and other, you know, just components of business industry in our, in our, in our world. And we have you to, to thank for thank that. You. So thank you again very much. I'd also like to obviously thank MCTV for, you know, being here with this uh, production and making this all come to fruition. And, and for everyone who is watching, thank you as well. And we will see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you very much.